Mattel has come out with a new line of gender-neutral toys. This is the Focus Group. It's the savvy side of 9 to 5. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. <laughs> and learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is the Focus Group with Tim Bennett. S-T-A-U-N-C-H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, Mr. John T. Nash. The T is for, well, I don't know what the T was for this week. Anything? My middle name. Middle name. <laughs> That's kind of boring. Let's go back to that one in a minute. I don't know if I've told the story about my middle name. So uh, be sure, thanks for joining us here every Wednesday at 1 p.m. East. And also thanks to those of you who are following along with our podcast which is called TFG Unbuttoned, and that's released every Tuesday morning. You can find out uh, all about John and me at focusgroupradio.com, and it lists all the shows and all our past audio and video programming is there. So that's the place to find out about us. How are you, John? It's October 9th, by the way, already fleeting. We're being bombarded by pumpkin spice. That happened in August. Which was ridiculous. <laughs> I did some Christmas shopping already at Costco. Did you really? Mm -hmm. And actually, before the camera started rolling, we were talking about Christmas and about client gifts and stuff. But the T, now you know that so my middle name's Thomas. Thomas and it, yeah. It's John Thomas, and you used to be Timothy Joseph. And I'm Joseph, yeah. So it's TJ and, and JT. And uh, when I was in London many, many, many years ago, this goes back to when, last century, as a matter of fact, when I f went to London for the very first time, my friend Jonathan, Jonathan, had a um, nose hair coming out of his nose. That was Jonathan Norton, who was the cruise director on the, uh, or he was like the purser or something on the Sea Dream yes. yacht. Anyway, I'm at this dinner party that Jonathan gives in my honor, and he said uh, he raises a glass of champagne. He says, "I'd like to welcome my friend John Thomas from across the Atlantic, from New York." To, and everybody starts laughing, like laughing. And I'm like, is that really funny to, to just do a toast to an American? Well, well, you know, and then some woman leaves over. She goes, you know what a John Thomas is in London, right? Or in England. I said, and she goes, a John Thomas is a cock or a prick. <laughs> so it's slang for, for dick, basically. Not being a... You know, the Brits are very sly that way. We had a woman that worked... Super sly. We had a woman that worked for us, and they kept calling her sugar. <laughs> what was that slang for? So I'm thinking, oh, isn't that nice? They're calling her sugar, you know, sugar, sugar. And they're going on and on. And, you know, she was a bit, yeah, I would say she had a bit of a horsey face. And that was a, a famous horse in England was sugar. So she thought it was all very nice. We all did. We all thought, oh, they're calling her sugar. It's like calling somebody honey. Are you serious? Yeah, come on, sugar. Let's go. Oh. <laughs> and then I finally asked him, like, what, are you saying sugar or sugar? They're like, sugar. It's, it's a famous horse in England with big teeth. I said, oh. Wow. Sure. Well, you know what? That just makes me like them even more. Well, and then they would always... Coded my, language. Coded. And the other, my other favorite thing was they did it, and I know they did it on purpose. Every single time we would have to have meetings with the Brits, the distributors, they always planned, Let's do, how about July 2nd through July 5th? How about, you know, it was always sometime <laughs> around then, and we'd say, that's, that's like our biggest summer holiday. It's a holiday. Holiday. Independence Day. It was like the 4th of July. Oh, 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 yes. Is that important for you? <laughs> we call that Good Riddance Day. <laughs> good Riddance to the Okay, colonies. let's pick another week. But they, and it was in every year. It was like clockwork. <laughs> We're thinking sometime June 3rd to June 6th. <laughs> it was always like, uh-huh, right. <laughs> now, see, I applaud that. Yeah. I applaud that kind of mischievous stuff. Um, you also had that experience. Well, you already told that. We've told that story, which I still love, about you, how you used to have kamikaze. What was On it? December 7th, which is so politically incorrect, which you could certainly not do now. But then, the, yeah, the Japanese would be all very inquisitive, like December 7th, December 7th. And, oh, now, have you. December 8th for us. Have you watched on uh, Netflix yet? Uh, and I have to watch it myself, but it's been recommended by a, reams of people. Sticks and Stones, uh, Dave Chappelle's new stand-up no. on Netflix. Um, no, I have not. The critics were like, wow, you know, how could he say these things about all these different people? Which I think is stand-up in general. Um, but the, the normal people, not the critics, but you and me, everybody I've talked to said it's uniformly funny from end to end. He doesn't 
No one's spared. It's like Archie Bunker and right. all in the family. No one's spared. We're the alphabet people since we're gay. The LGBT. Did, 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 did. <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't take Dave Chappelle to say that. You and I have been saying that for yeah. quite a while. I didn't vote on those letters being, I, I didn't vote on anything, actually, which suddenly the acronym existed, right? Is he politically incorrect? Yep. Way. It, it, yeah. It's funny. I was listening to in, in the car. It was Lady Bunny, and I think it was an NPR of all places. But anyway, Lady Bunny was being interviewed. And they were talking to her about how, and she was really somewhat upset about what's happened with comedy. And she said, you know, drag queens really built their reputation of being sharp-witted, sharp-tongued. She goes, because you were at late-night late night clubs, mostly gay, people were inebriated, and that was the shtick, right? You had to be sharp and on it, and every, everybody was equally yep. offended and equally... And she said... Lately, when they've tried to do these things, she said, the young audiences get upset if you say something, and they don't like the fact that we're either making fun of someone or something. And she said, they're also woke. She said, but guess what? We're not going to come out here and just do a, you know, scream a tagline and then lip sync a Lady Gaga song and get off. That's not entertainment. You know, a, a catchphrase and me lip syncing a song is not entertainment. She was giving a little dig to RuPaul's Drag Race. Because she said, you know, they essentially come out, they've got a catchphrase, they sing it, they sing, lip sync to a song, and they're done. She said, that's not what drag queens are. No, and uh, that banter. Or the drag culture. I and say. that banter with the audience was essential for hilarity. Yeah. You, you and I have been to shows in P Town, yeah. and they'll they'll nail a couple people in the audience, and everybody laughs. I never, I didn't see anybody ever walking out crying like, oh my god, the drag queen. There for it was like if you went to a Lisa Lampanelli show. Yeah. If you were going to be offended, yeah. you know, don't go. And she's actually said on the tickets, I said, if you can't laugh at a joke, don't come. <laughs> so so uh, in the booth, we have uh, Garrett and we have Steve and we have Robbie Bobby and Luby. There's a whole crew in there today. Hey, Garrett, um, what was Eddie Murphy's most famous stand-up? It was the one with Notorious where he's wearing that leather jacket. It's either raw or, del or delirious. I think it's raw, right? Was that my other first? That like you raw was the leather jacket one. Yeah, all right, that's the one. If you watch that today, I still laugh at everything he's doing up stage. But I, but that could, I don't even know how you could make that and televise it today, right? I don't think you could. Which reminds me that they were doing, and I don't know if it obviously it was the way they cut them. But do you know now on Me TV at six o'clock at night they're doing the Flintstones? Oh no! Seriously, it's From one of your favorite cartoons. <laughs> And they're actually, it's, the setups are hilarious because it's, they're, they picked all the very, very adult aspects of Flint, Which it was. A, which a, are quite funny. And it was a primetime cartoon. Yeah. But uh, I haven't caught it yet, but I keep seeing the advertisements for it. So I, I want to tune in and tune in and watch it and see what they've... Uh, Didn't you tell me recently you were watching, um, it was it Father Knows Best? Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> Here's a classic old... Clean show. Everybody loves Father Knows Best, right? But they were having an Indian exchange student come visit, who happened to be Rita Moreno, <laughs> A, <laughs> who is a Latino, but she's playing the Indian. So she's playing know. the Indian, and uh, so all the kids are in headdresses, um, thinking that it's Native Americans, and they're like, "Oh no, no, no! It's not that type of Indian with with it's it's not the woo 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 type." And they're doing, the, and I'm watching this, saying, "Oh my God!" Well, here is uh, Father Knows Best, 1959. 59. Okay. So then the girl arrives, and Rita Moreno arrives, and they, hi. Very young, Rita. How are you? They start talking to her like that. The little girl says, I thought she'd have a towel in her head and buckets on her shoulder. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and I'm watching this. I'm like, i got to hit the record button on this. I just can't believe what I'm hearing. <laughs> and the whole show went on, just stereotype after stereotype after stereotype. Was there a, a, a positive resolution to whatever the problem well, was? Well, by the end of the show, everybody's just people. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the show, people are people. Yeah. People All are people. All the misconceptions. And, and the funny, the mother gives a lecture to the family. As Americans, we have to put on a good good face for the country. It's important for us to show people how, how we are here in America and how we believe in truth and integrity. You know, she's given the lesson. She would, we should grab that clip and start putting it on uh, the airwaves right now, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it was... It was you just uh, remind me of something. Do you remember, was it the 70s? There was this group called Up With People. Oh, yes. And they would come to the, your school and do a show, Up Up With People. It was a recruitment. You meet them wherever you go. A recruitment for what? The human race? I mean... <laughs> no, it was a recruitment. It was a religious cult. It was not a religious cult. Yes, it was. Are you serious? Yes. 
It was religion. It's like when the, it's Christians. It's like when they used to bring in the, the Air Force Band or whatever to play. It was a recruitment tool for you to sign up for the military. Well, I would have rather signed up for military than the Up With People. But they, they wore those funny primary They're colors. They're crazies. <laughs> Did you, are, you just, are you just getting this now? Obviously, yes. Like my the reaction. Mormons coming to the school. They were a recruitment arm for yes. organized religion? Yes. Where were you? No wonder the song was so catchy. Still in my brain. They, they partially recruited I'm me. I'm surprised you didn't go. I almost got well, looped into selling books for that Southwestern Book Company my freshman year in college. <laughs> selling encyclopedias door to door. <laughs> oh. Went through all the meetings and everything, and I just sent Southwestern what? It's called South. They're still they're still in business. Southwestern Book Southwestern Book Company or Southwestern. And what you sell encyclopedia and then may I throw drop a Bible you off in a van in a neighborhood in different neighborhoods and usually low income. And you put a guilt trip on the housewives that you really should make your children kids need this encyclopedia. Right. Yeah. And uh, what are they selling today now? Encyclopedia. You know, my mom recently, when I was visiting my mom in the hospital, she had successful uh, heart valve surgery and she mentioned the world book. Yeah. So she said, honey, do you remember the world book? I said, yeah, we love the world book because it, you know, I would pick out any letter and we'd sit down and look through and sometimes it had the plastic or anatomy overlays. Well, she still has our rule book encyclopedia. Throw them away, Carol. <laughs> Why should she throw it away? What are you going to do with them? It was out of date when it was printed. <laughs> it was out of date when it... <laughs> yeah. But there you go. You know what we should do for the show? Mind the world book. We should find an entry That's that a good is idea. Today, totally uh, today's so... world book. That's, so we'll, we'll put it here. Maybe we'll bring it in addition. A and, letter. And just pull up. And you open randomly to an, an entry. And it That's will be a good like, idea. you know... You'll have to go get your world book next time you're visiting. You mean the... Ours went in the garbage. I believe my parents... Although, I'm not so sure. Did world book or Britannica? I don't know. It was something that was bought at the grocery store. You know, you get an edition each week or every two weeks. The new edition was there. My mother would buy it. My guess is it's either in the attic. I know it's... I haven't seen it around the house. My mother wouldn't throw something like that away, probably. Whole volume. And, you know, we we found out... One time I was visiting friends, my friend uh, Philip Blaine... His dad was a doctor. They were like from Sweden or something originally. And that's the, Philip, his, he had two older brothers and it was his family that introduced me to Star Trek, the original series. It was, I was on a sleepover the very first time I watched uh, a Star Trek episode. In fact, it was called The Ultimate Computer. Anyway, um, they had Encyclopedia Britannica. And I remember when my mom picked me up in the car, and I and she said, "Did you have fun with Phil?" I said, "Oh, we had a great time. I, I was I I found a new show called Star Trek, and then we looked through the Britannica, and she was Britannica, and then Britannica was a little was higher. Money. That was a higher end encyclopedia than World Book, which yeah. was already out of date, <laughs> already bad information when it started to happen. So you were you were in Britannica, man. You were you had some money. Yeah, you were right. Yeah, coin. Yeah, the Britannica, for example. Letter M, I think, is one of the thickest in the encyclopedia. I don't know why. It, 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 I'm, it's, uh, yes, I'm pretty sure it's M. All right, Pat Sajak. There, but the Britannica M was noticeably bigger than the World Book M, if you compared them side by side. I used to think it was the quality of the paper or something, but it turns out that Britannica had just a little more information per entry than World Book did. World Book might have been the cliff notes of encyclopedias. Is that possible? That or the one my mom got at the Grand Central grocery market, which was probably... <laughs> Just the People magazine version. We had sets of glasses that yeah. were from the Shell station. Flintstones. My uh, parents still use glasses that I won at the Southbury Fireman's Carnival back in the 70s. Carnival glass. Still have it. Carney glass. They're these little little glasses with flowers on them. So, hey, they so work, what, they what, work, right? Yeah. What caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Okay. This was in the news. It, it, it kind of made a splash. Uh, Mattel, maker of Barbie, debuts gender-neutral dolls. Uh, the company that conquered the doll world by dividing it into idealized Barbie and Ken is introducing a new line of gender-neutral dolls for boys and girls and children in between. Pat, Chris, Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> a line of gender-neutral dolls for boys, girls, and children in between. See how she slipped that in, the writer? The new line, called Creatable World, Creatable World, is intended to reflect our culture as the world continues to celebrate the positive impact of inclusivity, says Kim Colmone, the Mattel executive who led the team that designed the new dolls. Available in different skin tones, each doll comes with two wigs of different lengths, 
Hair types include curly, straight, and braided. And several wardrobe options that allow children to style the doll with short or long hair or in a skirt, pants, or both. Each kit, as they're called, costs about $30. They are intended to be relatable. All right, so you relate to the doll, but they're not aspirational. So I read that... Oh, girls to me. E Are they girl dolls? No, they're gender neutral. So if you put your... It, well, you know, you could put a boy, tomboy clothes... Uh, Boys, look. what do you think? Wait, do, do these have, like, the attachable genitalia, like your doll No, no, that's, oh. my, that's my artist <laughs> rendering aid. Which you still need to bring in, by the way. Which I do need... Thank you, Steve, which I do need to bring in. These dolls look gender neutral to you? No. I don't know. What do you think, John? Are they supposed to be boys or girls, or what are they? They're, well, it says here... Uh, are they named? I don't know about yes, that. Pat, Terry. They're, they're not aspirational. They're relatable. So aspirational would be, I want Barbie's tits someday. As relatable is, I look like this doll. You know, because oh. nobody could look like Barbie. I mean, the, the waist was too... Anyway. Um, oh, I see. I thought when we did the tease, I would have said gender neutral, that it was just going to be a doll. Well, there are other images online that show the dolls side by side, and their and their faces really are just kind of neutral. And depending on the hair and stuff, you could definitely well, the clothing all looks feminine to me. No, um, that that picture does, but I've seen well, you know, yeah. Uh, so let's get this to develop the dolls and their accessories. All components are original, and research and design took eighteen months. Mattel worked with physicians and experts knowledgeable about gender identity, as well as 250 families across the country, including children of all gender identities. We talked to them about what they had in dolls currently and what they were looking for. What did the researchers learn? The kids didn't want to be told that boys had to play with cars and girls had to play with dolls. But, you know, since we were kids, we've learned that. I mean, I, I used to, I, you know. Play with a doll, you had a G.I. Joe or something. Ah, uh, that's see that then that's the whole gender thing. GI, I, I was a. Did you play with a Barbie? You no. Know, so I was when You're I played. Doll. I had Flatsy. Flat. That's a great. Yeah, I love the Flatsy. So my sisters had Barbie, the older one. Laura had Skipper, the younger one. The, my younger sister. And when I was a, when when I was playing dolls with the girls, I had to be Ken or I had to be GI Joe. Now, G.I. Joe was big, and yeah. you know, he could do lots of things. But they eventually bought me a Ken doll one year in a tuxedo. <laughs> Ken would take the girls to prom and to dinner. I mean, he was like, let's go to dinner. <laughs> I know, I know. Ken pay? <laughs> uh, so, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say those dolls don't last one season. Uh... Well, we'll they, be seeing those at the they have caused a bit of consternation in the marketplace, and it's along generational divides. So depending on how old you are, this is an unacceptable doll. Or if you're younger, this is a case. Hey, cool, it's gender neutral. And apparently, and I'm just going to wrap up this one, by it's a, it's a kind of a sidecar story to this. I didn't know this, but uh, in 2015, Target announced that it would no longer use signs to label toys for girls and boys. That year, the same year, the, in 2015, the Disney store banished girl and boy designations from its children's Halloween costumes, lunchboxes, backpacks, and other accessories, labeling all items for kids. For kids. So any kid could be Woody. Anybody, any kid could be Ariel from The Little Mermaid, including your son. Halloween costumes? Yeah, because it's just for kids, costumes. And Amazon no longer uses gender-based categories for children's toys, which I did not know. So now if you go to Amazon, you search boy, cho, boy, toys for young boys. You may get toys, but they're not necessarily... What if you want to buy a jockstrap on Amazon? Am I going to have to weed through bras? Well, last, time, last time an eight-year-old needed a jockstrap. So. No, I mean, if you're an adult, I mean, this is where this is going. <laughs> How would you? Well, you know. There, there is a difference between boys and girls. Yeah, yeah. And clothing. Including that, yeah. And, uh, God, I'm remembering the, uh, when we were introduced to those, was that, did you get introduced to that in, in, um, gym class? Was it like eighth grade or something or, or freshman year? High school, freshman. Yes, freshman year high school. Everybody's got to wear a jock. A what? <laughs> Holds it up. Like, what the hell is that's that? That's when the note came from Carol Nash that John had asthma. John can no longer do gym for the next four years because his breathing troubles him. John and the. Ouch. John and the girl in the wheelchair went to study hall. That's why you were so smart. You had extra study hall. I had always had a free period, and, uh, and, and I didn't miss much of anything, according to what I know. I, didn't, I, didn't, I missed crab soccer and being yelled at and not doing well. Square dancing. We had to square dance. 
That was gym class? Mm -hmm. Don't play like you don't know what went on. <laughs> <laughs> don't play like, I don't. I didn't take it, I was excused. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Mine's a little different. This new shop has hunky, shirtless baristas serving espresso. That's very different than gender neutral dolls, I'll say, right? So this opened a couple of weeks ago in Seattle in the uh, Capitol Hill section, which is where all the gays congregate. It's uh, called Dream Boys Espresso, and they've gone the Chippendale route, offering a bit to drink and a show. Customers can come up through the drive through and uh, have a spot of espresso, and then I wait for the boys who are shirtless to do their little thing. They wear bow ties. Um, so far, the two, the two boys, and they spell it B-O-Y-Z, which I hate, named Jashawn and Brendan, or Brandon, have, uh, have been doing well. The store had taken a change. Change Initially, it was called Ladybug Espresso, and it had girls in bikinis running around selling espresso. That didn't work, so they decided to change to man, to males. And they said the males have gotten a better reception than the girls in the bikinis. So vo drink volume is increased or whatever? That's what they say. They said that this, and they said a fun fact, they said the idea of sexpresso stands got its beginning in Seattle. I'll debate that. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, the idea began to percolate, ha, 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 before it blossomed in 07. And there was a number of these shops with men, and scantily clad men and women that would serve, serve coffee in Seattle. Listen, way back in the forever, they've had topless donut shops in Maine. Well, oh, you know something? I know that fact because when we did the tour of the L.L. Bean factory, oh. you talked about when the Japanese would come. The Japanese and the old white man, when we go to L.L. Bean, I had to take them to the topless donut shop. It was the, the topless, that's where I learned that. Okay, the topless donut shop. Yeah. And, and it's still there? You know, that was 15 years ago. I... I don't think it is. What a shame. But it was the topless donut shop. We'd pull in coffee, coffee. Japanese want coffee. Coffee donut, coffee donut. Off we go. They'd go in, come out with a big smile, had a good day ahead of them. <laughs> it's usually some old hag. The needs are simple, huh? 38 longs are hanging down with dugs. They're pot. dugs at that point. <laughs> I think they call them dugs. So yeah. they are. So anyway, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to go into the Capitol Hill section, be sure to go see Dream Boys Espresso. I don't know. Is that, a, is that a turn on for you? Did you go in there to see something like that? Get a nice tea? If the option was a Starbucks with, with, just, with just a boring old Starbucks or going in and having my iced tea served to me by some well-built uh, muscled hunk with no shirt on, B. I'll take B. Okay. I'm cheap. <laughs> I'll go see the I'll go That's see what the they're fresh. hoping. That's I'll, what they want. I'll go see that. It's our business birthday today. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. Born October 9th in 1938, he died in 2008 at 69 years old, Rocky Aoki. His real name is Hiroki Aoki, Japanese-born American wrestler and restaurateur, he founded the popular Japanese cuisine restaurant chain, Benihana. He founded Benihana, and he was a former wrestler. Right. So he was a big-time wrestler in Japan. He actually uh, qualified for the 1960 Summer Games in Rome as a wrestler and ended up not wrestling. It says he did not compete, which I don't know why. So he later then came to the U.S. and toured. He was undefeated in the 112-pound flyweight class. And uh, he was given a bunch of wrestling scholarships and ended up attending Springfield College in Mass and then later transferred to Post College on Long Island, CW Post. Mm -hmm. And he moved to New York City where he was still wrestling. He won, won the titles in 62, 63, and 64. And uh, he, it got him inducted into the Wrestling Hall of Fame. But while he was in New York and studying at school, he rented an ice cream truck in Harlem. <laughs> Every Are you day. Serious? So he would, seven days a week, he had an ice cream truck and he had a route in Harlem. And uh, he was studying restaurant manage at, management at the New York City Community College. He saved up $10,000. So at 25 years old, he went and opened a restaurant on West 56th Street that he called Benny Hanna. It was just a four table tapanaki restaurant. On West 56th, back in the day. Okay, interesting. And um, the name Benny, the name Benny Hanna comes from. Uh, the Japanese name for safflower, which Aoki's father said after the war and Tokyo was bombed out, 
he happened one time across one single red sapphire that was sapphire that was growing in the rubble. So that's how they got the name Benihana. Ah, okay. And uh, so the concept was, it was meal, meals were, have you ever eaten at one? Yeah. So meals are theatrically prepared by a knife-wielding, joke-telling chef at a tapenaki table surrounded by wooden eating surfaces in front of the guests. <laughs> Tapan meaning steel grill or griddle and yaki meaning broiled. And uh, it didn't do well when it first opened, but then the New York Herald gave it a rave review. And next thing you know, the Beatles and Muhammad Ali and everyone else was lining up. They only had four tables. Wow. So the following year, he, ended up in, he, end, the following year he opened up a bigger restaurant, then expanded in 68 to Chicago. And the restaurant grew up to about uh, 100 and some restaurants. In 82, they went public. He made a big mistake by going into fast food and trying to be uh, more upscale, and it didn't do well. I remember that. Was that... Um... It was called Big Splash. Oh, oh, oh. I thought it was like the frozen prepackaged. Well, they had the frozen stuff that didn't do well either. So the, 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 ups, the um, desire to go upscale and the frozen food division both bombed. And uh, they ended up buying a couple of other smaller chains. And in 2004, the, uh, the company did a preferred stock, um, preferred stock sale, and they lost controlling interest. So on the slide you had up about him, he died at 69. Yeah, so he... I think that's kind of young. Yeah, he was married, he was married to... They were famous for the mug, which, is, which was... A, that's a picture of him with uh, Trump, which I thought was funny. And then a very young Trump. That mug boy. was famous for them. That was their the Buddha mug. The with little the... Buddha mug. Hotai. Hotai was his name. A chubby Buddha-like figure with his arms raised. It's become a collectible. He also had a porno magazine called Genesis. He started in 73. God bless him. It was supposed to compete with Playboy and Penthouse. It didn't do well, although it lasted for 40 years. He also was an offshore powerboat racer. Married three times. He sued his kids in 05 because they tried to get his, his uh, businesses and fortune worth about $100 million. He died in New York City of pneumonia. He suffered from diabetes, hepatitis C, and cirrhosis of the liver. Wow. So, Benny Happy Hanna, birthday like, of Rocky. They, I don't know if every restaurant that does that kind of eating at the grill, chef prepares, comedic routine, but when Bob and I did that uh, cruise that years ago, we were, I think it might have been a Benny Hanna on board the ship, or it was something like it. But, you know, they toss the food at you. Yeah. You have to catch it with your mouth. And at one point, I, I catch something in my mouth, and I just look at Bob. I said, you know, I didn't come on a cruise to be a seal in a show at SeaWorld, you know. You have to understand, when you go on these trips, you have to play along. <laughs> you have to understand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> you, you can get grumpy real quick. Don't you think? I got, well, yeah, because I didn't like playing along. And you know me. You know me. You didn't want to sing along karaoke. Sing either. along karaoke. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, right. it's different. So, <laughs> it's not different. So, a, a, anyone who uh, follows along with us, you should know that Deep Discount's a partner of ours here on the Focus Group. And uh, be sure to go to focusgroupradio.com and click on the Deep Discount logo. They've got an under a Blu-ray under $15 sale going on right now. And uh, there was lots of things to pick from. So, John, what did you what did you choose this week? I'm going to uh, I, I picked a movie that was introduced to me by none other than Scott Mogren, a friend of ours from the Scott Mogren. Yeah, from the past. And you know where I learned about this title? I learned about this. Hi, Scott Mogren. Yeah, former HR guy. Yeah, right. Yeah. This okay. So this movie. We were at that Standard Is it Hotel. An adult film? <laughs> no, we, it was. It's a. It's a. It, we we're at the a Standard Hotel. We were wearing suits and ties after that dinner, right. and those three girls had come over, and they're like, one of them wanted me to show her my room, and I'm like, yeah. no, you don't have to go upstairs. The view's the same. Yeah. They're like, why well, yeah, you passed up that opportunity. Anyway, I asked Scott what his favorite movie was, and without hesitation, he said the movie Jawbreaker. Have you seen this movie? I've seen an adult film called Jawbreaker. Well, <laughs> <I haven't> seen... <laughs> I've seen an adult film called Job. Oh, wait. I repeated your punchline. I can't do it anymore. All right, so. What is Jawbreaker? When an ordinary kidnapping, right off the bat, there's nothing ordinary about kidnapping. When an ordinary kidnapping prank leaves the future prom queen dead, accidentally gagged with a Jawbreaker candy. <laughs> A deadly, sweet prank leads to cover-up, makeover in this edgy and unpredictable comedy, but there will be no mercy as prom night arrives, bringing this spirited tale to its cruel Tina dropping, tiara dropping conclusion. So after that trip to L.A., this is way, this is many years ago, so I remember it was, I think it was Netflix was still doing the DVD thing by mail. I remember signing up, getting this movie. You did not. 
It's hysterical. It's so only 87 minutes long. It's a different version of Heather's. Remember Heather's with right. Nona Ryder? So it's mean girls doing mean things, but it's a notch above it. And I was shocked that Scott liked it, but I liked it. So I recommend Jawbreakers. He loves as a, a little California For under 15 movie. bucks, right? What the hell? He loves a California girl movie. Mine is a classic, and I, there were so many things I could pick out, and I don't know why I got very nostalgic, so I picked out National Lampoon's Animal House. Frankly, because of the price. So to get a blue... <laughs> Frankly, because of the... Yeah. Well, and I don't have it. And it, I don't have it in my collection. And so for here, you, you save uh, 30% and you get it for uh, $10.49 on Blu-ray. But uh, typical, you know, frat house movie, food fights, toga parties. And uh, it, there was a couple of facts about it that I thought were interesting. You, you know, it was Kevin Bacon's first movie. I didn't realize that. That was really Kevin Bacon's first movie. Okay, that's interesting. And Faber College, which was actually the University of Oregon, and the reason that was the only school that allowed him to shoot on campus, and uh, the only reason Oregon agreed, and they didn't even read the script, but they only agreed because they turned down the graduate to record on campus, and they, they weren't going to let another movie go by. The blanket decision from the committee, never let Hollywood yeah, never go Never let Hollywood by go again. by. Okay. And then... Um, they said the only reason that Universal Studios gave the green light to the movie was because Donald Sutherland was the only really recognizable star. He, he appeared as one of the professors. But John Belushi was in there, Tim Matheson, um, and uh, other, other uh, actors, of course, that, that had gone on to other things. The movie came out in 78, and uh, Otis Day and the Knights, from the song Shout. Yeah. I, the, the real guy's name, I thought it was an actual group, his name was Dwayne Jesse. He played Otis Day, the singer of the band. And after the movie was so popular, he actually ended up changing his name to Otis Day. <laughs> and I saw the band play up at uh, Denison University in Ohio. A bunch of us took a, took a car up and snuck into the concert. They played the song Shout three times. <laughs> they opened with Shout. They did some other kind of You know what that reminds you of? Shout again, Shout on an encore. When I saw Joan Jett and the Black Hearts for the first time, uh, I love rock and roll was the opening, <laughs> the encore, and the encore again because they only had the one album. So. Uh, so, what's the release this week? Well, the release this week is a movie that I should have seen. So I'm losing my animation, uh -oh. my animation membership card. Toy Story Four uh, available now on Blu-ray. Yeah, dropped in the pecking order of Bonnie's toys. Woody looks for new purpose in mentoring her current favorite, Forky, an arts and crafts project she made from a spork. During a family RV road trip, the existentially confused Forky runs off, sending Woody on an adventure chase that brings him to a reunion with the th thought lost Bo Peep and tough choices for his future. Fourth movie in the franchise, obviously Tom Hanks reprises his role, his voice role as Woody, Tim Allen as uh, Buzz Lightyear, Annie Potts as Bo Peep. Keanu Reeves makes an appearance voice. Now, the movie got great reviews. I heard nothing but good things about it, but I got to tell you, for me, Toy Story kind of was over at Toy Story 3. Why? Well, you know, I don't know. It's Actually, the first one was perfect. They didn't have to make any other ones. But they did get better and better. They claim this is great. I'm going to have to see it. I'm going to have to buy it from Deep Discount, um, especially since it's Blu-ray and digital, I think, and watch it. But um, for some reason lately, sequels have just not been interesting me, to me. I, maybe it's because there's so much original stuff or new characters to, to uh, explore and find out. I don't know. So anyway, uh, we encourage you to go to focusgroupradio.com and click on the deep discount logo, Arr, the pirate slash shark, and begin your, uh, begin your uh, shopping trip. We've covered a couple movies. Uh, for the Blu-ray under 15 sale, I recommend the Jawbreaker. Tim, a very good recommendation. It should be in everybody's collection, Animal House. Of course, as I say that, I'm wondering about the PC side of that, but... Oh, no, yes. <laughs> we talked about that with Will and Lori, about how the they're opening, being, One yeah. of the opening scenes in that is just, you can't... Oh, yeah. And the new release this week is Toy Story 4 on Blu-ray. Garrett, what do we say? Thanks, Deep Discount. We are going to take a super quick break, and when we return, some shop talk for you, so stay with us. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with The Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just yeah. do it. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back to The Focus Group. John and I were talking 
during the uh, during the quick break. Do here, that. Our, our, Do our that break, sometimes. Prelude there. So we have a shop talk today to uh, to share with you, and I read this and I kind of tilted my head, but uh, we'll go through it. So it's. Uh, he approves the topics, by the way. This was sent to Tim. I was like, yeah, we'll do that as a shop talk. You know, I look at, so this is one of these where you judge a book by the cover. So I judge an article by the headline. Headline. So the headline is Google's former head of HR issues a warning that all business owners and leadership teams should read. The house is burning, the house is burning. That was the headline. House is burning. House well, is on you fire. and I have talked about how Google has the craziest sort of interviewing process. And, you know, how many red balls can you fit in the country of Canada? Or how many? Yeah, exactly. You know, stupid questions like that. Anyway, the uh, and then the sub subhead is culture matters now more than ever. Laszlo Bach mm -hmm. shares three reasons. The timing has never been better to invest in your organization's culture because culture influences decisions and decisions can make or break a business. So, so I agree with that. That statement by itself is a fact. Right. Corporate culture or small business organization, entrepreneurs, how you conduct yourself internally affects decisions. Um, he actually goes on to say that failures of culture, meaning corporate culture, have been the single biggest destroyers of value in the last five years, which is interesting. So if a company missteps or the company's internal compass is off somehow, this causes a lot of problems. And he, in fact, references a couple of big missteps. The Wells Fargo thing where they set up all those dummy accounts. Right. Facebook's privacy issues. And, of course, Johnson & Johnson's recent opioid indictment and settlement, you know, for the pushing of the uh, opioids. And they mentioned the Volkswagen emissions scandal. Yep. But in all of those... Those were really, those came down from the top, didn't they? In other words, you didn't just go have rogue managers opening up dummy accounts at Wells Fargo. No. And uh, he says lack of clear values, ethics, and core principles. But I think where you're going with it's coming from the top down is you can have a corporate culture and everybody can subscribe to it. But if the C-suite decides to do something rogue, well, how does that have anything to do with all that culture you built up? Is that where you're going? Or? Yeah, well, so, you know, you and I lived through the Volkswagen emissions diesel scandal and all of the people that we worked with and the people in every place but Germany were all equally taken yep. taken aback Shocked. by what happened there Shocked. because it all happened in, you know, the factory in Germany and the Americans and everybody else. I mean, the billions and billions of dollars that cost the company. But I wouldn't say that that was... A, a cultural, cultural failure. A culture yeah. failure in yeah. Volkswagen of America. I would agree. Um, because everybody we dealt with in VW America was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Here we are carrying water up the hill, selling the car, and boom. So um, the former head of HR at, at Google, Laszlo Bach, uh, recommended three or has three areas to look at. One, the, the internal is now external. Of all the three things... This is probably the most truthful, which is now how a company conducts itself, um, how it treats employees, the environment they create, hiring practices. These now are things that are external because consumers want to know, what, what am I buying into as a brand or as a company? Yeah, and I, I'd put a side note in here because they gave the example of Campbell Soup, CEO, who yeah. said, to win in the marketplace, you must first win in the workplace. And again, this is nothing new. If you treat your employees well... They're going to be your champions. And they're going to treat the customer well. Mm -hmm. If you don't treat your employees well, they're going to give an SHIT, and they're not going to treat the customer well. So, right, if, you're, if you make happy employees, what is it? Happy, happy cows make happy cheese? Happy cows make happy cheese. All right, so <laughs> Laszlo Bach didn't have to write a book. He could just come to us. Yeah. We'll, we'll give him the metaphor. The data, and then it says the data on culture shows clear economic impact. So I didn't quite understand where they were going on this one. I I'd actually put a question mark with an arrow that said what, because they referred to something called the nudge. That's internal to Google. So when Google has an employee come on board, they're given a nudge at some point. And this which means what? The nudge, which came in the form of an email, well, a.k.a. a reminder, a prompt, or a suggestion. That's what Google considers. And that's to get the person to start producing, which sounds really not so nice. But the nudge, which came in the form of an email reminder to managers, resulted in a new employees becoming competent in their roles 25% faster than other employees. What was confusing about that, but it took me a while to analyze this, so the manager of a new employee is given the nudge to make sure the new person's been onboarded correctly, they're comfortable, and they're part of the team, and they're producing. 
So it's not to the new employee, but get them, get them motivated, looped make into sure, the looped into yeah, the and make sure they're part of the culture and if they have any questions, et cetera. Right. Well, that could have been written better. Agreed. Totally agreed. It was number three. Number three is people technology has advanced enough to help. So while the introduction of employee engagement, pulse and satisfaction surveys, organizations can get a better understanding of what their employees are experiencing and gather ideas to help improve their working conditions and productivity. This may work just Jim dandy for a company of thousands of people. But if you own a small business and you have three employees, you're going to know immediately what's working and what's not working, right? Yeah. So this article actually could be, I think, applies to far larger organizations with robust HR departments with, you know, I wanted to have an MBA. Okay, well, we can, you know, be benefits the whole bit. But I think if you're a small business owner or a consultancy, your culture is very apparent. Yeah, and this, you know, this this just shows to me, you and I used to bring on a lot, a lot of business book authors, and we always said there's one business book, just a different color, just a different cover. <laughs> yeah, on, on serious, we used to do it all the time. Well, that's right? really what this is. I mean, he yeah. went and wrote this business book, essentially wanted to write about the importance of having a good culture, because a good culture is going to produce positive results, and positive results are going to give you a, a better bottom line. Happier employees, employees, better bottom line. I could have written the book. Boom. Now, we have to go through 10 other chapters. So you, you literally just wrote like one page of a multi-page book, and hey, the publisher gave an advance, so you got to start writing. <laughs> I, was, I, I, I am always still fascinated, though, by this whole Google thing of how you would answer questions of how many red balls are there in Canada. And I guess they want us to see your logic as to how you would come how up with your How you would problem solve, how you break yeah. it down, how you solve it. You know, the last time I was at the Google offices here in New York, um, it was a weird, weird meeting because we walked by a room with a bunch of people sitting in it, and they were not talking to each other. They were just tapping on their laptops. And the guy that was giving us the tour said, this group is trying to figure out what their new projects are going to be and how they're going to contribute to the company. And then we walked by a foosball table, a pool table, and a full-blown kitchen where they were preparing to serve some kind of fancy lunch to some of the employees. And I thought... They're in a room. They're being paid by you to sit in a room to figure out what they're going to do to contribute. Who has jobs like that? When you're hired, you're told here's here's your role, and you can move into other roles and stuff. Yeah, that's crazy money. Google for you. <laughs> I, ad, ad sales are doing well with that. Click 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 click. They're making a lot of money on that. It, it reminds me of I, I listened to um, author David McCullough was given a lecture about the importance of history and the importance mm -hmm. of children learning history and, and how we don't really do that much anymore in the arts and Shame. and uh, music and all this stuff. And he said, you know, people have to understand that there are things that are required of you. Some things you just have to do because they're required. And he said, and we don't ever. No. We were taught that. Well, when when you got a job, your first job out of, out of high school or first job out of college, and maybe we were supposed to question what we were doing. I don't know. Uh, Maybe we would question it ourselves, perhaps, but... I was just happy to have the job. Yes. <laughs> I was just happy to have the job. All right. We're going to wrap things up for the day. We want to thank you for uh, joining us today here on The Focus Group. Remember to check out Unbuttoned, our uh, Tuesday podcast, audio podcast. You can get our show as well on audio if you haven't been watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live. Focusgroupradio.com is, in fact, the URL from where we find all our, all our information at. We want to thank Deep Discount for joining us as a partner on the show. It is a Blu-ray 15 and under sale, which means all Blu-rays are under $15, which means buy a bunch. So I recommended a movie called Jawbreaker. As Tim said, you, Scott Mogren never met a movie about Southern California girls that he didn't like. I right? loved a California girl movie. <laughs> Cal that's it, California girl movie. Tim recommended Animal House, and this week's new release is Toy Story 4, which I am, I has, I'm, I'm abashed to say I have not seen, and I should see it because it's a beautiful piece of animation and good storytelling. So we say, don't text and drive, arrive alive, and we will see you in the new week. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.